Ziki Chizuku's Reviews, bringing you a southern perspective on books, movies, music, and much, much more. Stick around for a while, you just might hear something wicked. Hi there friends, it's good to see you again and thank you for joining me again on, oh what episode is this? This is episode 23, good to see you again. So, as this is a, going to be an, a Wednesday read, we're going to pick up with the Bible Book of Promises again. And this subject and topic for tonight is going to be comfort and contentment. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will fear, will not fear, we fear. Ah. Let me start that one over again. God is our refuge and strength. A very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. Psalm 46, 1 through 3. That one's very difficult to read as it's written. Hmm. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. Thou shalt stretch forth thine hand against the wrath of mine enemies, and thy right hand shall save me. Psalms 138, 7. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. Psalms 18, 2. For he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither hath he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard Psalms twenty two twenty four. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. Psalms thirty seven twenty four. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. Nahum 1 7. But the salvation of the righteous is the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble. Psalms 37 through 30. 37 39. Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. Psalms 55:22 These things I have spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace in the world ye shall have tribulation but be of good cheer I have overcome the world John 16:33 Come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest Matthew eleven twenty eight. For the for as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. Second Corinthians one through one five. The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. 
Psalms 9 9. For the Lord will cast off forever, but though he cause grief, yet will he have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. For he doth not afflict willingly, nor grieve the children of men. Lamentations 3 31 through 33. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Psalms 27, 14. Contentment. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. Proverbs 17, 22. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Hebrews 13, 5. All the days of the afflicted are evil, but he that is of a merry heart hath a continual feast. Proverbs 15, 15. A sound heart is the life of the flesh, but envy the rottenness of the bones. Proverbs 14, 30. But godliness with contentment is great gain. 1 Timothy 6.6 6. Let not thine heart envy sinners, but be thou in the fear of the Lord all the day long. For surely there is an end, and thine exception shall not be cut off. Proverbs 23.17-18 Well, that's interesting. And I shall be right back after a short break. Okay, sorry about that. Um, didn't want to get interrupted, so we had to go to a quick break. So we'll be carrying on with Aeneas and Dido, book four of the Aeneid, and I'm just going to read um, about a quarter of this section because this section is about 28, 29 pages or so. So let's just go ahead and get right into it. Aeneas and Dido. But the queen finds no rest deep in her veins. The wound is fed, she burns within with hidden fire. His manhood and the glory of his race are an obsession with her, like his voice, gesture, and countenance on the next morning. 
After a restless night, she sought her sister. I am troubled, Anna. Doubtful, terrified, or am I dreaming? What new guest is this to come to our shores? How well he talks, how brave. He seems in heart and action, I suppose. It must be true. He does come from the gods. Here proves a bastard spirit. He has been so buffeted by fate. What endless wars he told of. Sister, you must tell me something. Were not my mind made up once and for all, never again to marry, having been so lost? When Scaeus left me for the grave, slain by my murderous brother at the altar, were I not sick forever of the torch? In bridal bed, here is the only name. Who has moved my spirit, shaken by my weak will? I might have yielded to him. I recognize the marks of an old fire, but I pray rather that earth engulf me. Lightning strike me down to the pale shades in everlasting night. Before I break the laws of decency, my love has gone. With Scasius, Sc let, let him keep it. Keep it with him forever in the grave. She ended with a burst of tears. Dear sister, dearer than life, Anna replied. Why must you grieve all your youth away in loneliness? Not know sweet children or the joys of love? Is that what dust de demands and buried shadows? So be it. You have kept your resolution from Tyr to Libya. Proved it but denying. Eobar, Eobar, boss, Erebus, and a thousand other suitors from Africa's rich kingdoms think a little whose lands are these you to settle in. Getulians, invincible in war, the wild Numidians, unfriendly Sirps, ring us around, and a desert barren with drought. And the Barsanian Rangers, why should I mention tear and wars arising? Out of Pygmalion's threats, and you, my sister, why should you fight against a pleasing passion? I think the gods will have willed it so, and Juno has helped to bring the Trojan ships to Carthage. What a great city, sister, what a kingdom! This might become rising on such a marriage, Carthage and Troy together in arms. What glory might not be ours? Only invoke the blessing of the great gods, make sacrifice, be lavish, and welcome. Keep them here while the fierce winter rages at sea, and cloud and sky are stormy, and ships still wrecked and broken. So she fanned the flame of the burning heart. The doubtful mind was given hope and the sense of guilt was lessened and first of all they go to shrine and altar imploring peace they sacrifice to Ceres, giver of law to Bacchus to Apollo and most of all to Juno in whose weeping the bonds of marriage rest in all her beauty Dido lifts up the goblet pours libation between the horns of the white heifer slowly or slowly moves to the rich altars noting the proper gifts to mark the day or studies the sacrificial entrails for the omens alas poor blind interpreters what woman in love is helped by offering or altars soft fire consumes the marrow bones the silent wounds grow Deep in the heart, unhappy Dido burns and wanders, burning all up and down the city, and what the way a deer, with a hunter's careless arrow in her flank, ranges the uplands, with the shaft still clinging to the hurt side. She takes Aeneas with her, all through the town, displays the wealth of Sidon, building project buildings projected she starts to speak and falters and at the end of the day renews the banquet it is wild to hear her story over and over hangs on each word 
until the late moon sinking sends them all home. The stars die out, but Dido lies brooding in an empty hall alone, abandoned on a lonely couch. She hears him, sees him, or sees and hears him in Aeolus, fondles the boy as if that ruse might fool her, deceived by his resemblance to his father. The towers no longer rise, the youth are slack, in drill for arms, the cranes and derricks resting, walls halt halfway to heaven. And Juno saw it, the queen held fast by this disease, this passion, which made her good name meaningless. In anger, she rushed to Venus. Wonderful. The trophies, the praise, you and that boy of yours are winning. Two gods outwit one woman. Splendid, splendid. What glory for Olympus. I know you fear me, fear Carthage, and suspect me. To what purpose? What good does this all do? Is there no limit? Will we not both be better off to sanction a bond of peace forever, a formal marriage? You have your dearest wish. Dido is burning with love, infected to her very morrow. Let us, why not, conspire to rule one people on equal terms. Let her serve a Trojan husband. Let her yield her Tyrian people as her dowry. This Venus knew was spoken with a purpose, a guileful one, to turn Italian empire to Libyan shores, not without reservation. She spoke an answer. Who would be so foolish as to refuse such terms, preferring warfare if only fortune follows that proposal? I do not know. I am more than a little troubled. What fate permits, will Jupiter allow it? One city for the Tyrians and Trojans, this covenant, this mixture, you can fathom his mind and his, and ask him, being his wife, I follow, wherever you lead. And royal Jun Juno answered, that I will tend to listen to me and learn how to archive the urgent need, thy plan, Aeneas, and poor Dido go to go hunting. When sunlight floods the, in the world, tomorrow morning, while the rush of the hunt is on, and the forest shaken with beaters and their nets, I will pour down dark rain and hail, and make the whole sky rumble with thunder and threat. The company will scatter, hidden or hiding in the night and shadow, and Dido and the Trojan come for shelter to the same cave. I will be there and join them in everlasting wedlock. She will be his own, his bride forever. This will be their marriage. Venus assented, smiling, not ungracious. The trick was in the open. Dawn, rising, left the ocean, and the youth come forth from all the gates, prepared for hunting, nets, toils, wide spears, keen-scented coursing hounds, and Dido keeps them waiting. Her own charger stands bright in gold and crimson. The bit foams. The impatient head is tossed. At last she comes. With a great train attending, gold and crimson, quiver of gold and combs of gold, and mantle of crimson with, gold, with golden buckle, a Trojan escort attends her, with Aeolus and Aeneas comes to her side, more lordly than Apollo. Bright along Delos ridges in the springtime, with laurel in his hair and golden weapons shining across his shoulders, equal radiance is all around Aeneas, equal splendor. They reach the mountain heights, the hiding places where no trail runs, wild goats from the rocks are started, started run down the ridges elsewhere in the open, deer cross the dusty plain away from the mountains. The boy, Ascantius, Ascanius, Neus, Ascanius, Canius, in the midst of the valley, is glad he has so good a horse, rides dashing past one group or another, 
deer are cowards. And while goats tame, he prays for some excitement, a tawny lion coming down the mountain, or a great boar with a foaming mouth. The heaven darkens and thunder rolls, and rain and hail come down in torrents. The hunt is all for shelter, Trojans and Tyrians, and as Cananeus dashing wherever they can. The streams pour down the mountains to the same cave go Dido and Aeneas, where Juno, as a bridesmaid, gives the signal, and the mountain nymphs wail high in their incantations. First day of death, cause, first cause of evil. Dido is unconcerned with fame, with reputation, with how it seems to others. This is marriage for her. Not whole and corner guilt, she covers her folly with his, this name. Rumor goes flying at once through all the Libyan cities, rumor than whom no other evil was ever swifter. She thrives on motion and her own momentum. Tiny at first in fear, she swells. Colossal. In no time walks on earth, but her head is hidden among the clouds. Her mother, earth, was angry. Once at the gods and out of spite produced her, the titan's youngest sister, swift of foot, deadly of wing, a huge and terrible monster, with an eye below each feather in her body, a tongue, a mouth for every eye, and ears double that number. In the night she flies above the earth, below the sky, in shadow, noisy and shrill, her eyes are never closed in slumber, and day by day, and by day she perches, watching from tower or battlement, frightening great cities. She heralds truth and clings to lies and falsehood. It is all the same to her, and now she was going, happy about her business, filling people with truth and lies. Aeneas, Trojan-born, has come, she says, and Dido, lovely woman, sees fit to mate with him, one way or another. And now the couple, wanton out of winter, heedless of ruling, prisoners of passion. They were dirty stories, but the goddess gave them to the common ear, then went to King Eaba, Eaba, Erebus, with words that fired the fuel of his anger. This king was Ammon's son, a child of rape, begotten on a nymph from Garamantia. He owned wide kingdoms, had a hundred altars, blazing with fires to Jove, eternal outposts in the gods' honor. The ground was fat with blood, the temple portals blossoming with garlands. He heard the bitter stories and went crazy. Before the presences of many altars, beseeching and imploring, Jove Almighty, to whom the Moorish race on colored couches pours festive wine. Do you see these things? Or are we a pack of idiots, shaking at the lightning? We think you brandished, when it is really only an aimless flash of light and silly noises. Do you see these things? A woman who used to wander around my lands, who bought a little city, to whom we gave some plow land and a contract, disdains me as a husband, takes Aeneas, to be her lord and master in her kingdom. And now, that second Paris, with his lackeys, half-men, I call them, his chin tied up with ribbons, with millinery on his perfumed tresses, takes over what he stole, and we keep bringing gifts to your temples, we devout believers, forsooth, an idle legend. And Job heard him, making his prayer and clinging to the altars and turned his eyes to Carthage and the lovers forgetful of their better reputation. He summoned Mercury, go forth, my son. Descend on wing and wind to Tyrian Carthage. 
speak to the Trojan leader loitering there, unheedful of the cities given fate, given by fate. Take him my orders through the rapid winds. It w was not for this his lovely mother saved him. Twice from Greek arms, she promised he would be a ruler in a country loud with war, pregnant with empire. He would sire a race from Teucer's noble line. He would ordain law for the world. If no such glory moves him, if his own fame and fortune count as nothing, does he, a father, grudge his son to the towers of Rome to be? What is the fellow doing? With what amb ambition wasting time in Libya? Let him set sail. That's all. Convey the message. Before he ended, Mercury made ready to carry out the orders of his father. He strapped the golden sandals on, the pinions to bear him over the sea and land. As swift as the breath of the wind, he took the wand which summons pale ghost from hell, or sends them there, denying or giving sleep, unsealing dead men's eyes, useful in flight, through wind and stormy cloud. And so came flying till he s saw the summit and towering sides of Atlas, rugged giant with heaven on his neck, whose head and shoulders are dark with fur, ringed with black cloud and beaten with wind and rain and laden with the whiteness of falling snow with rivers running over his aged chin. And the rough beard I stiffened. Here, first on level wing, the god paused briefly. Poised plummeted to the ocean like a bird that skims the water's surface flying low. By shore and fishes rocky breeding ground. So Mer Mercury darted between earth and heaven to Libya's sandy shore, cutting the wind from the home of Maya's father. Soon as the winged sandals skim the rooftops, he sees Aeneas founding towers, building new homes for Tyrians. His sword is studded with yellow jasper he wears across his shoulders. A cloak of burning crimson and golden threads run through it, the royal gift of the rich queen. Mercury wastes no time. What are you doing? Forgetful of your kingdom and your fortunes? Building for Carthage? Woman crazy fellow, the ruler of the gods, the great compeller of heaven and earth, has sent me from Olympus with no more word than this. What are you doing? With what ambition wasting time in Libya? If your own fame and fortune count as nothing, think of Ascanius. At least, whose kingdom in Italy, whose Roman land are waiting, as promise justly do. He spoke and vanished into thin air. Appalled, amazed, Aeneas is stricken dumb. His hair stands up in terror. His voice sticks in his throat. He is more than eager to flee that pleasant land, awed by the warning of the divine command. But how to do it? How get around that passionate queen? What opening try first? His mind runs out in all directions, shifting and veering. Finally, he has it, or he thinks he has. He calls his comrades to him. The leader bids him quietly prepare the fleet for voyage, meanwhile saying nothing about the new activity since Dido is unaware, has no idea that passion, as strong as theirs, is on the verge of breaking. He will see what he can do. Find the right moment to let her know. All in good time. Rejoicing. The captain's move to carry out the orders. Who can deceive a woman in love? The queen anticipates each move. Is fearful even when everything is safe. Foresees this cunning and the same troublemaking goddess. Rumor tells her the fleet is being armed, made ready for voyaging. She rages through the city like a woman mad or drunk the way the mint Maenads go howling through the nighttime on 
Scytheron, when Bacchus's symbols summon their clashing with their clashing. She waits no explanation from Aeneas. She is first to speak, and so, betrayer, you hope to hide your wickedness. Go sneaking out of my land without a word. Our love means nothing to you. Our exchange of vows, and even the death of Dido, could not hold you. The season is dead of winter, and you labor. Over the fleet, the northern gales are nothing. You must be cruel, must you not? Why, even if ancient Troy remained, and you were seeking not unknown homes and lands, but Troy again, would you be venturing Troyward in this weather? I am the one you flee from, true. I beg you, by my own tears, in your right hand I have nothing else left in my wretchedness. By the beginnings of marriage, wedlock, what we had, if ever I served you well, if anything of mine was ever sweet to you, I beg you, pity a falling house. If there is a room for pleading, as late as this, I plead, put off that purpose. You are the reason I am hated. Libyans, Numidians, Tyrians hate me, for my honor is lost, and the fame I had that almost brought me high as the stars is gone. To whom, O oh guest, I must not call you husband any longer. To whom do you leave me? I am a dying woman. Why do I linger on? Until Pygmalion, my brother, brings destruction to this city. Until the prince Earbus leads me captive. At least if there had been some hope of children before your flight. A little Aeneas playing around my courts to bring you back. In feature, at least, I would seem less taken and deserted. There was nothing he could say. Jove bade him keep affection from his eyes and grief in his heart. With never a sign, at last he managed something. Never, O oh queen, will I deny you merit. Whatever you have strength to claim, I will not regret remembering Dido while I have breath in my body or consciousness of spirit. I have a point or two to make. I did not, believe me, hope to hide my flight by cunning. I did not ever claim to be a husband, made no such vows. If I have fate's permission to live my life my way, to settle my troubles at my own will, I will be watching over the city of Troy and caring for my people. Those whom the Greeks had spared in Priam's palace would still be standing for the vanquished people. I would have built the town again, but now it is in Italy I must seek, great Italy. Apollo orders and his oracles call me to Italy. There is my love, there is my country. The towers of Carthage, the Libyan city, citadels, can please a woman who came from Tyr. Why must you grudge the Trojans, the Sonian land? It is proper for us also to seek a foreign kingdom. I am warned of this in dreams. When the earth is veiled in shadow and the fiery stars are burning, I see my father, Ancaeus, or his ghost. I am frightened. I am troubled for the wrong I do my son, cheating him out of his kingdom in the west and lands that fate assigns him. And a herald, Jove's messenger, I call them both to witness, has brought me through the rush of air his orders. I saw the god myself in the full daylight. Enter these walls, I heard the words he brought me. Cease to inflame us both with your complainings. I follow, I follow Italy, not because I want to. Out of the corner of her eyes she watched him during the first of this, and her gaze was turning now here, now there, and then, in bitter silence, she looked him up and down, and then blazed out at him. You treacherous liar! No goddess was your mother. No Dardan... Dard... Dardanus, 
the founder of your tribe, son of the story, stony mountain crags begotten on cruel rocks with a tigress for a wet nurse. Why fool myself? Why make pretense? What is there to save myself for now? When I was weeping, did he so much as sigh? Did he turn his eyes ever so little toward me? Did he break at all or weep or give his lover a word of pity? What first, what next? Neither Jupiter nor Juno looks at these things with any sense of fairness. Faith has no heaven, haven anywhere in the world. He was outcast on my shore, a beggar. I took him in, and like a fool, I gave him part of my kingdom. His fleet was lost. I found it. His comrades dying, I brought them back to life. I am maddened. Burning, burning, now Apollo, the prophesying God, the oracles of Lycia, and Jove's herald, sent from heaven, come flying through the air with fearful orders. Find business for the gods, the kind of trouble that keeps them from their sleep. I do not hold you. I do not argue either. Go and follow Italy on the wind and seek the kingdom across the water. But if any gods who care for decency have any power, they will land you on the rocks. I hope for vengeance. I hope to hear you calling the name of Dido over and over in vain. Oh, I will follow in black as fire, then cold death has taken spirit from body. And when cold death has taken spirit from body, I will be there to haunt you, a shade all over the world. I will have vengeance and hear about it. The news will be my comfort in the deep world below. She broke it off, leaving words unfinished. Even light was unendurable. Sick at heart, she turned and left him, stammering, afraid, attempting to make some kind of answer, and her servants support her to her room, that bower of marble, a marriage chamber once. Here they intend her, help her lie down. And that was a little saucy now, wasn't it? That is going to take some time to digest. So I'm going to leave it at that for the Aeneid. And I'm going to take a short break and I will join you right after the break. See you on the other side.
All right, welcome back from the break. So after that crazy wicked drop there of the Ed, we'll continue on with something fairly, fairly uh, potty mouth here. Um, continuing on with Hunter S. Thompson's Song of the Doomed, Bonzo Papers, Volume 3, more notes on the death of the American dream. And like I have said on Wednesday reads, viewer discretion is advised. The last train from Camelot. October is the cruelest month of any election year, but by then the pain is so great that even the strong are like jelly and time has lost all meaning for anybody still involved in a political campaign. By that time, even candidates running unopposed have abandoned all hope of victory and live only for the day when they will finally be free to seek vengeance on all those treacherous bastards who once again once passed themselves off as loyal friends and allies and swore they were only in it because they all shared the same hopes and dreams october in the politics business is like drowning in scum or trying to hang on through the final hour of a best bastinado punishment the flesh is dying and the heart is full of hate. The winners are subpoenaed by divorce lawyers and the lo losers hole up in cheap motel rooms on the outskirts of town with a briefcase full of hypodermic needles and the, and the certain knowledge that the next time their names get in the newspaper will be when they are found dead and naked in a puddle of blood and in the trunk of some filthy stolen car in an abandoned parking lot. Others are not so lucky and are doomed, like Harold Strassen, to wallow for the rest of their lives in the backwaters of local politics, cheap crooks, and relentless, humiliating failures. By the time Halloween rolls around, most campaigns are bogged down in despair and paralyzed by a frantic mix of greed and desperation that comes with knowing that everything you have done or thought or worked for or believed in for the past two years was wrong and stupid. There are never enough seats on the last train out of the station. 
memo from Skinner. Doc, don't call me anymore. I quit. Politics is a disease for dirty, for dirty little animals. We were wrong from the start. I had a dream last night. It scared me worse than anything that ever happened to me. It was so horrible and so real that I woke up screaming and burned all the skin off my off the back of my hand. But I was so crazy, I never even noticed it. I didn't even feel it when that bitch bit me in the face. Hell, that was nothing. This time I saw the devil, and it scared the shit out of me. He tried to get his hands on my throat, but I kept stabbing him. And then I saw all those people running out of the White House and screaming about murder. I thought they had killed Bush, but it turns out that Bush had murdered Quail, shot him with a Luger. The night cook said she had heard them screaming and fighting all night and drunk on whiskey in the Lincoln Room. It was nothing new, but this time George started slapping him around a little bit. He said Quail was stealing from him. He just stepped back and shot him nine times in the stomach and then gouged out one of his eyes while he was dying. Death to the weird. November has finally come and the fat lady is about to sing for a lot of people who will call it a hateful noise, even though they always swore they loved music. The campaign is over unless somebody gets assassinated. And even that probability wouldn't make much difference unless it was Jesse Jackson. No riots could erupt if any others were croaked. You can't miss what you never had. Quote, The dog sucked his brains out. The girl replied, He's dead. San Francisco, 1988. Note from Ralph Steadman. Hunter S. Thompson does not suffer fools gladly. In fact, I have reason to believe that I am the only fool he has indulged like a twin in all of his life. But that is long, a long and other story. All kings need their fool. King Lear's fool was his wisdom and finally his vision. Hunter has both in full measure and needs neither fool nor pretender to forge his destiny and maybe ours. Nevertheless, as the fool, I am determined to make my presence felt, if only on the tattered end papers of his third cumbersome volume of scruffless prose, and put the record straight. It was I who darkly saw what he needed to know in Kentucky, and it was I who raged against the coming of the light in Miami and at the Watergate hearings. It was I who knew for certain that America was sick at heart, and it was I who discovered the dark legend of Hawaii through Robert Hughes' book of Captain Cook's voyage and realized that Hunter may be the reincarnation of Lono. The god returned after 1,500 years of wandering like a lovesick child to save his people and his beloved American constitution. Make no mistake about that, for he is your savior. savior. And he is guardian of all you profess to hold dear. In his weirdness, he illuminates the faults in your reason and etches the silhouettes of your antics against a pure white background, like a Balinese shadow, like Balinese shadow puppets. For better or worse, he sees inside the blackness of those silhouettes, searching for the soul of a nation. United only in its desire to seek individuality in a melting pot. It is a privilege to have him in my life. Ralph Stedman, 20th of July, 1990. Quote, Most of the big shore places were closed now, and there were hardly any lights except the shadowy moving glow of a ferry boat across the sound. And as soon as the moon rose higher, the inessential houses began to melt away until gradually I became aware of an old island here that flowered once for Dutch sailors' eyes, the fresh green breast of the new world, its varnished trees, the trees that had made way for Gatsby's house, 
have once pandered in whispers to the last and greatest of all human dreams. For a transitory, enchanted moment, man must have held his breath in the presence of his content of his continent, compelled into an aesthetic contemplation he neither understood nor desired face to face for the last time in history with something cons commensurate, commensurate to his capacity for wonder. F. Scott Fitzgerald, the Great Gatsby. That's the end of that section. So, the next section, next Wednesday read, will be the 50s. Last Rumble in Fat City. So, we shall look forward to that. I wonder what sort of shenanigans he might get up to. So, I'm going to go ahead and plow right on through, and we will be continuing with our English literature section for this episode. And I'm going to read a few sections out of the introduction about Old English poetry this time. The Anglo-Saxon invaders brought with them in a tradition of oral poetry. See Bede and Cademan's Hymn, page 30. Because nothing was written down before the conversion to Christianity, we have only circumstantial evidence of what that poetry must have been like. Aside from a few short inscriptions on small artifacts, the earliest records in the English language are in manuscripts produced at monasteries and on and other religious establishments beginning in the 7th century. Literacy was mainly restricted to servants of the church. And so it is natural that the bulk of Old English literature deals with religious subjects and is mostly drawn from Latin sources. Under the expensive, expensive conditions of manuscript production, few texts were written down that did not pertain directly to the work of the church. Most of Old English poetry is contained in just four manuscripts. Germanic poetry, uh, oh, hold on, Germanic heroic poetry continued to be performed orally in alliterative verse and was at times used to describe current events. The Battle of Brunnenberg, which celebrates an English victory over the Danes in traditional alliterative verse, is preserved in Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. The Battle of Maldon in the Norton Anthology of English Literature Archive. That means that you can just go to the archive of the Norton Anthology and you, you should be able to find this manuscript. Commemorates a Viking victory in which the Christian English invoke the ancient code of honor that obliges a warrior to avenge his slain Sorry, I'm watching a naughty kitty right now. He's up to something. Okay. Commemorates a Viking victory in which the Christian English invoke the ancient code of honor that obliges a warrior to avenge his slain lord or to die beside him. These poems show that the aristocratic, heroic, and kinship values of Germanic society continue to inspire both clergy and laity in the Christian era, as represented in the re relative small body of Anglo-Saxon heroic poetry that survives. This world shares many characteristics with heroic world described by Homer. Nations are reckoned as groups of people related by kinship rather than by geographical era areas. And kinship... Hold on. 
Just a moment. Okay, sorry. Nations are reckoned as groups of people related by kinship rather than by geographical areas, and kinship is the basis of the heroic code. The tribe is ruled by a chieftain who is called king, a word that has kin for its root. The lord, a word derived from Old English, Lof or loaf plus weird protector surrounds himself with a band of retainers, many of them his blood kindred, who are members of his household. He leads his men in battle and rewards them with the spoils. Royal generosity was one of the most important aspects of heroic behavior. In return, the retainers are obligated to fight to the death for their lord and if he is slain to avenge him or die in the attempt blood vengeance is regarded as a sacred duty and in poetry everlasting shame awaits those who fail to observe it even though the heroic world of poetry could be invoked to rally resistance to the viking invasions it was already remote from the Christian world of Anglo-Saxon England. Nevertheless, Christian writers like the Beowulf poet were fascinated with the distant culture of their pagan ancestors, and by the inherent conflict between the heroic code and a religion that teaches that we should forgive those who trespass against us, and that all that they take, all they take, all that they that is worded weird <laughs> all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword the beowulf poet looks back on that ancient world with admiration for the courage of which it was ca capable and at the same time with elegaic sympathy for its inevitable doom for anglo-saxon poetry it is difficult and probably little fut probably futile to draw a line between heroic and Christian, for the best poetry crosses that boundary. Much of the Christian's poet Christian poetry is also cast in the heroic mode, although the Anglo Saxons adapted themselves readily to the ideals of Christianity, they did not do so without adapting Christianity to their own heroic ideal. Thus Moses and St. Andrew, Christ and God the Father, are represented in style of heroic vo voice, verse, in the dream of the rude, which if you'll recall that was in episode one, or three, sorry, it was the first Wednesday read. The cross speaks of Christ as this young man, strong and courageous. In Cadman's hymn, the creation of heaven and earth is seen as a mighty deed, an establishment of wonders. Anglo-Saxon heroines, too, are portrayed in the heroic manner. St. Helena, who leads an expedition to the Holy Land, to discover the true Anglo-Saxon. Hold on. St. Helena, who leads an exped expedition to the Holy Land to discover the true cross, is described as a battle queen. The biblical narrative related in the Anglo-Saxon po poem Judith is recast in terms of Germanic heroic poetry Christian and heroic ideals are poet poignantly blended in the wanderer, which laments the separation from one's lord and kinsman, 
and the transience of all earthly treasures, love between man and woman, as described by the female speaker of the wife's lament, is disrupted by separation, exile, and malice of kinfolk. The world of English poetry is often elegaic. Men are said to be cheerful in the mead hall, but even there they think of war, of possible triumph, triumph, but probable failure. Romantic love, one of the principal topics of later literature, appears hardly at all. Even so, at some of the bleakest moments, the poets powerfully recall the return of spring, the blade of the magic sword with the with which Beowulf has killed Grendel's mother in her sinister underwater lair begins to melt, as ice melts when the father eases the fetters off the frost and unravels the water ropes, he who wields power. The poetic diction, form formulaic phrases, and repetitions of parallel syntactic structures which are determined by the versification are difficult to reproduce in modern translation. A few features may be anticipated here and studied in the text of Cademan's hymn. Turn it below 31 through 33 with interlinear translation. Poetic language is created out of a special vocabulary that contains a multiplicity of terms for lord, warrior, spear, shield, and so on. Synodosh and metonymy are common figures of speech, as when keel, K-E-E-L, is used for ship or iron for sword. A particularly striking effect is achieved by the kenning, a compound of two words in place of another, as when sea becomes whale road, or body is called life house. The figurative use of language finds playful expression in poetic riddles, of which one, about 100 survive, common and sometimes uncommon cre creatures, objects, or phenomena are described in an it Enigmatic, en enigmatic passage of alliterative verse, and the reader must guess their identity. Sometimes they are personified and ask, what is my name? Because special vocabulary and compounds are among the chief poetic effects, the verse is constructed in such a way as to show off such terms by creating a series of them in apposition. In the second sentence of Cademan's hymn, for example, God is referred to five times appositively as He, Holy Creator, Mankind's Guardian, Eternal Lord, and Mighty Alm and Master Almighty. This use of parallel and appositive expressions, known as variation, gives the verse a highly structured and musical quality. The overall effect of the language is to f formalize and elevate speech. Instead of being straightforward, it moves at a slow and stately pace with steady misdirection, a favorite mode of this indirection, as is irony. A grim irony pervades heroic poetry even at the level of diction where fighting is called battle play, a favorite device known for the rhetorical term litotes is ironic understatement after the monster Grendel has slaughtered the Danes in the Great Hall Her It stands deserted. The poet observes it was easy then to meet with a man shifting himself to a safer distance. More than a figure of thought, irony is also a mode of perception in Old English poetry. In a famous passage, the wanderer art articulates the theme of 
Ubisoft where they are now? Where did the steed go? Where the young warrior? Where the treasure giver? Beowulf is full of ironic balances and contrasts between the aged Danish king and the youthful Beowulf, and between Beowulf and the high-spirited young warrior at the beginning, and Beowulf, the gray-haired king, at the end, facing the dragon and death. The formal and dignified speech of the old English poetry was always distant from the everyday language of Anglo-Saxons, and this poetic idiom remained remarkably uniform throughout the roughly 300 years that se separate Cademan's hymn from the Battle of Malden. This clinging to old forms, grammatical and orthographic, as well as literary, by the Anglo-Saxon church and aristocracy con conceals from us the enormous changes that were taking place in the English language and the diversity of its dialects, the dramatic changes between Old and Middle English did not happen overnight or over the course of a single century. The Normans displaced the English ruling class of their own barons and clerics, whose native language was a dialect of Old French, what we call Anglo-Norman, without a ruling literate class to preserve English traditions, the custom of transcribing vernacular texts in an earlier form of the West Saxon dialect was abandoned, and both language and literature were allowed to develop unchecked in new directions. For examples of Irish medieval literature, see Cucullan's, oh, Cucullan's Boyhood Deeds. An excerpt from the old Irish epic, Tambo Coolidge, the cattle raid of Cooley, and some delightful monastic lyrics. So, I think that tonight I shall read you the riddles that this section was talking about. Saga Hwe Ehat, say what I am called, is a frequently repeated imperative in the Corpus Anglo Saxon riddles, the Exeter book, circa 975. Not only contains moving, elegant poems, such as The Wanderer, The Wife's Lament, Wolf and Iridasser, Dwaser, but also a striking collection of 90 or so riddles, like the elegies. The riddles are conveyed by first-person narr narrators, and also, like the elegies, they refuse to disclose the full conditions of their utterance, whereas that refusal produces an emotional charge in the elegies. In the riddles, it produces an intriguing and cognitive challenge. The Anglo-Saxon riddles are clearly related to a learned Latin tradition of enigmas, enigmatus, even if their subject is derived from the empirical world of natural phenomena, of everyday objects and animals, they provoke subtle imperative challenges that defam ah, defamiliarize the everyday world. When a poem fails to supply the crucial form of recognition, what am I, or what I am, around which understanding rapidly organized perception. Then every feature of the familiar becomes suddenly fascinating. Outworn metaphors spring into rich conceptual life that which is regarded as purely conceptual is returned to its material condition 
The everyday event becomes a wonder. Comedy leaps up unexpectedly forth from the revitalized account of the humdrum. Things and creatures disclose their mysterious and layered life in the world. Just going to read you one riddle. Then we shall wrap it up for this episode. Riddle one. My break points downwards and I travel low and dig along the ground. Move forward as the wood's old foe propels me and my lord and guardian walks stooping at my tail, pushes and moves and drives me on the field. Sows in my track, I sniff along the ground, brought up from the forest, firmly bound, and borne upon the wagon. I have many wonders, and as I move on one side, there is green, and my clear track is dark upon the other. A well, more, a well made point is driven through my back and hangs beneath. And through my head another firm pointing forwards that my teeth tear up falls down beside me. If he serves me well, who as my lord controls me from behind? And the answer is plow so I shall wrap up this episode 23 and get this uploaded to YouTube as quickly as possible and I will continue in my next episode with a Thursday read and uh, also also um Whoever out there was kind enough to donate to my surgery fund, thank you so much. I very much appreciate it to the two anonymous donors. It will it will help get gas and lunch for my husband and my brother that are going to be taking me to my surgery and get us back and forth to the doctors until the surgery, which uh, tomorrow I'm supposed to have an uh an appointment with my new surgeon um the first surgeon dropped me he wouldn't see me because i refused to get the you know can't say that on youtube but you, you get the gist um so i'm meeting this new surgeon tomorrow and we're going to see if uh if we can go f forward with the the repair surgery and um and I really appreciate it. It's it's more than I wasn't even expecting it. When husband came in and said, "Honey, someone donated," and they also sent prayers as well. So thank you, thank you. You don't know how much it means. So, God be with you. Have a good rest tonight. Eat well. Um. Stay hydrated um, and have a great day tomorrow and this week and Happy New Year. And I hope you also had Merry Christmas. Um, yeah, so that's it for tonight and I shall see you next time. Thanks for listening.